we all have the duty to get vaccinated against COVID-19. When it's your turn to take the vaccine, please take your vaccine. All approved COVID-19 vaccines have been thoroughly tested and all provide a high degree of protection against getting seriously ill and dying from the disease. When it is your turn to take the vaccine, it is important to be vaccinated as soon as possible and not wait. This way we build immunity in our communities faster and we can get back to our normal lives. The COVID-19 vaccine will not give you COVID. However, mild to moderate vaccine side effects are normal. When a virus enters the body, the body fights back. Common symptoms like fever or chills are the result of our immune system attacking the virus by increasing blood flow and raising our temperature. Vaccines are designed to activate the immune system in the same way but without making us sick. While it's normal to build immunity without side effects, it's also normal for some people to experience mild to moderate symptoms after being vaccinated like pain at the injection site, fever and chills. These symptoms usually last a few days and will go away on their own. Once you have taken the vaccine, it can take two to three weeks from the final vaccination to be fully effective. It's especially important to continue all precautions during this period to protect yourself and others. COVID-19 vaccines are safe. All vaccines go through three different clinical trial phases. Monitoring for safety is ongoing and nothing affects your genetic code. People who have already had the virus do still need to be vaccinated. Immunity can weaken over time and be strengthened with vaccinations. Even if a person has contracted and recovered from COVID-19, the immunity can be boosted by a vaccine. It is better to have natural immunity plus vaccination than to just have natural immunity. When talking to other people about the COVID-19 vaccine, please follow the following steps. Step 1. Listen with empathy and acknowledge how they're feeling. Step 2. Ask open-ended questions to help you understand their concerns. Step 3. Only share trusted information. Visit the World Health Organization website, chat to your doctor or a nurse to find answers to common questions. Step 4. Explore reasons for wanting to get vaccinated. Share your motivations and what helped you to overcome any concerns you may have had. Vaccines bring us closer. Choose to get vaccinated. West Africa web titled Exploiting Africa's Creativity for Technology Advancement, presented by Professor Mike Bruton. I'm your host, Stephen Lang. At the end of Prof. Bruton's presentation, I'm sure we can convince him to take a few questions. Mike Bruton was born and educated in South Africa, where he obtained his MSc and PhD degrees from Rhodes University. He has also been awarded an honorary doctorate by his alma mater. <clears throat> After a successful career as an aquatic ecologist, conservationist, and ichthyologist, Mike embarked on a new career in science communication in the 1990s. He developed the educational programs of the Two Oceans Aquarium in Cape Town and then established the highly successful MTN Science Center, now known as the Cape Town Science Center, that has received over 1 million visitors. He has also been intimately involved in the establishment of science centers and museums in Johannesburg, Utenhage, and Umklanga, as well as in Bahrain, Dubai, and Saudi Arabia. In retirement, he occupies himself doing research, writing books, and giving talks on his twin interests in biology and innovation, and has authored nine popular science books over the past eight years. He has been a regular supporter of SciFest Africa since its inception, 
and recently retired as the chairman of CIFES Advisory Committee. In his most recent book, Harambi, The Spirit of Innovation in Africa, which was published only this month, Mike Bruton argues that the key quality of African innovation is that it expressed at all three levels, from high to middle to low tech, simultaneously as the needs and wants of its people dictate. So let's hear about exploiting Africa's creativity for technology advancement. Over to you, Prof. Bruton. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Stephen, for that intro introduction. And it's great to be contributing to SciFest again from my home here in Cape Town. Um, this is one of the first seminars in the virtual expo that SciFest is hosting on creative science, which will continue from October this year through until March next year. And I will be talking about African innovation. Mike, just click on that button that says resume slideshow there, just to the left and down a little. Down, yeah, click on resume. Yeah, that's it. Oh, there we okay, we're there? Yeah, good. Can you see the screen? Yes. Right, most of what I'm going to discuss is, as Stephen said, uh, mentioned in my latest book, Harambi, The Spirit of Innovation in Africa. And I'm going to start with low-tech um, innovations, which are and, and, uh, from ancient civilizations, and I think many of them are probably familiar with, uh, to you. This, for instance, is the so-called first chemistry set from Blombos Cave, found by Professor Henshelwood and his team which has been dated to over 100,000 years before present. And it, it's a quite remarkable discovery because it shows that these early inhabitants of Africa were combining multiple ingredients to make colored pastes um, in order to use them for decorations or for skin protection. And some 30,000 years later, they were already making glues and other adhesives for a wide range of, of uh, complex steps and 60,000 years before present, crafting finely honed uh, bone arrowheads and so on. So um, Brombos Cave, Classes River Cave and others have revealed remarkable innovation among um, early inhabitants of Africa. This is something else found from Brombos Cave. It's regarded as the earliest known abstract artwork discovered anywhere in the world from 87,000 years before present. And as you can see, it has this sort of hashtag pattern of um, deliberately scraped lines crossing over. We don't know the exact significance of them, um, but it is a remarkable early, early piece of art. Uh, another early um, device that has been discovered in Border Cave up in Maputland is a lunar stick dating from um, some 35,000 years before present, which is regarded as the first mathematical device. It has 28 notches cut into it. Uh, tombs and paintings in the tombs of ancient Egypt reveal some remarkable um, early innovations. Thousands of years ago, um, hooks, some with barbs and some without, uh, were being used to catch fish. Um, nets, same nets made from um, fiber uh, were already in use in that time. And here we can actually recognize the squeakers and the tilapias um, uh, in this picture. Mapum Gopwe is a, an amazing um, late stone age uh, city. Mapum Gopwe means heel of the jackal. Uh, sorry, it's an Iron Age archaeological site in northern Limpopo from about 1200 years ago. 
and one of the most remarkable artifacts there showing the level of technological innovation is the golden rhining, rhino of Mapungupwe. Um, the rhino, of course, being a symbol of authority. And this rhino has been made from sheets of gold, carefully hammered and shaped uh, to form this remarkable artwork. Here's a, another amazing uh, early African innovation. It's called the Lukasa Memory Board and it was made by the Luba people from the DRC. And it's, it's something that the um, elders in the village used to record knowledge. And uh, according to early accounts, virtually all the knowledge they had at the time could be recorded and encoded on these remarkable memory boards. Early fishing techniques reveal uh, quite advanced technologies uh, among um, African people. This is a Isifonia fishing basket being used in the Pongola floodplain in Northern Zululand. And you can see around the waist of the, the woman fisherman, uh, sharp tooth catfish um, attached to her belt, which she's caught using this device. Sadly, like many of our other traditional fishing methods, Ponya fishing is about to go extinct. Uh, just a few decades ago, hundreds of people con um, took part in Fornia drives. When I lived in Zululand in the, in the 70s and 80s, uh, it was down to a few dozen, and now it's virtually uh, extinct. Another indication of early fishing techniques are the rock barrier traps, which can be found along our Southern Cape coast, such as these at still by, where the water goes over the barrier at high tide, and then the fish are trapped at low tide. And in several places along our South coast, you can see, still see these rock barriers. If we go further north to the Comores, uh, there they still use traditional dugout canoes, such as this one with a double outrigger and no sail, um, used around the shores of Grand Comor, uh, mainly to catch oil fish, but catching coelacanths as a bycatch. And here's a typical um, crab track, um, and also a fish trap from Pajé in Zanzibar. It's a collapsible trap, so uh, it can be collapsed for easy transport. And of course, it's made out of natural fibers. So if it is lost at sea, it does not carry out ghost fishing. The fibers will rot away and it will no longer continue to catch. Whereas Madeira traps now made out of nylon uh, continue to catch prey for decades if they are lost out at sea. Other examples of sophisticated um, craft and traps used for fishing the, as a Zimbabwe fishing village on Lake uh, Chilwe in Malawi, where people live for several months of the year uh, close to the fishery uh, with their exquisitely carved uh, dugout canoes and also clinkable boats. And up in the Congo, um, these classic uh, barrier traps, uh, valve traps, used near Malepo Pool and in the Congo River are still in use today, catching fish in a sustainable way. And of course, the most famous example around South Africa are the barricade fish traps uh, at Cozy Bay. Now, in my book, I give many, many other examples of the ways in which traditional knowledge has been used uh, beneficially. But there are also examples recently of it being misused. And here's the young president of Madagascar, Andri Rajolina, um, who has been promoting the use of uh, indigenous products um, and homespun rem remedies for countering COVID. For instance, drinking ginger and lemon tea, uh, steam therapy, but mainly this um, COVID organics, also known as um, uh, CVO, which contains extracts from Artemisia annua, which is a sweet wormwood, a plant that has a proven effectiveness against malaria, but no proven effect on COVID-19. And Rogelina has insisted that this be used by Madagascar people, it be distributed to schools, despite the fact that the World Health Organization and UNESCO have both indicated that there is no proof whatsoever uh, that CVO um, can cure or prevent uh, COVID-19. So this is a sad misuse of indigenous knowledge. 
Now let's move on to some more beneficial examples. Here's James Murithi from Kenya. Uh, he began farming crickets in October 2018 after attending a training course at uh, Jomo Kenyatta University in Nairobi. His initial plan was to make cricket flour uh, to feed his chickens, but one day he fried some chickens with onions and found that they tasted quite delicious with a nutty flavor and a hint of grassiness. He's now actively promoting the commercial farming of crickets as food for humans and research has revealed that crickets contain twice as much protein and more iron uh, as an equivalent amount of beef and are also gluten-free. Furthermore, they can be eaten fried or made into flour that is mixed with millipup, chapati or pasta. Now here's a remarkable example of innovation gone wrong. Unbelievably, a Dutch company holds a patent for Ethiopia's most popular food, injera. And this is a dish of injera that I enjoyed with my family in, in Cape Town recently. According to the European Patent Office, Dutchman Jans Ruzjen claimed that he had invented the flatbread made from teff flour in 2003, even though it is derived from a plant indigenous to Ethiopia that Ethiopians have been using for centuries to make spongy fermented pancakes that they eat with virtually all their meals. Fortunately, um, the Ethiopian government has fought back and uh, they are now reclaiming their traditional uh, injera. Here's a uh, fairly low uh, tech example of a very successful product developed by Thato Gathatlanye, uh, a solar, solar powered backpack. Um, She's from South Africa, and this is something she developed in 2013, where the backpack that kids yet wear to school uh, has solar power to charge up batteries. Moving further afield, a remarkable example of an activist and innovator um, from Gambia is Isato Cize, who is locally known as the Queen of Recycling. Uh, she's initiated su a, a successful recycling movement in the Gambia called One Plastic Bag. She's empowered women for over 17 years, teaching them how to turn plastic waste uh, into income. And with over 2000 members in 40 groups in many different countries and projects with the European Union and the UD UNDP, her NGO, Women's Initiative, The Gambia, is making a huge difference. She's also launched a, pro a program to make cooking briquettes from dried grass, mango leaves, coconut fiber, and paper, which provide a cheaper and less toxic source of household fuel uh, compared to charcoal briquettes, which also contribute to deforestation. Another interesting innovation I came across in the educational field are the camel libraries that have been founded in Northern Kenya and elsewhere in the Sahel uh, since 1985. Uh, because camels are such hardy animals, they can travel very long distances in arid environments. And they carry heavy boxes of books. And when the camel library are, are li arrives with its handler at a school or a community center, the books are unpacked and are made available for use. Here's one of my favorite low-tech uh, South African innovations. And it's something that's been implemented in the Okavango Delta in Botswana by Shepo Ditabang. Uh, working with an, a group in Australia, they wanted to develop a way in which they could reduce predation by lions on their cattle without having to destroy the predators. So they carried out an experiment where they painted uh, realistic eye spots on the uh, backsides of cattle from 20, 124 different herds. And they did this to over 2000 cattle painting eye spots. Others they painted just with a simple cross and others uh, were unpainted. And they found after the end of the three year project that none of the cattle with the painted eye spots uh, suffered predation uh, from lions, whereas uh, a fair number of the unpainted ones, 15 out of 8 to 35, uh, were taken by lions, and four uh, out of four, 543 of the cross painted ones uh, were predated on. 
and these results confirmed their hunch that creating the perception that a predator had been seen by the prey could cause it to abandon the hunt. <clears throat> Another low-tech innovation, this time by a craftsman uh, who's become a good friend, David and Do Davis and Dungu, who sells his goods at the waterfront in Cape Town. He collects discarded flip-flops that were washed up on the seashore, um, glues them into colorful blocks, and then carves um, innovative animals um, out of the blocks. And he has a coelacanth that he carved uh, for me. Another local craftsman is Vincent Chenserai, and he makes um, art and craft works out of discarded metal. Once again, I commissioned him to make a coelacanth, and he did a great job of it. Another craftsman or artist in Cape Town is Ndakuko in Ntuli, uh, who sells his work through the Art at Africa Gallery. And you can see here he has created a remarkable three-dimensional uh, portrait of the late Nelson Mandela uh, using uh, plastic bottle tops, wood chips, and even bits of old cell phones. And we've now mounted a campaign in Rondebosch where we're all collecting discarded plastic bottle tops uh, for Andre Kuko to uh, develop his artworks. Moving more into the design and, and fabrics, um, I can mention one example. Uh, in Ghana, uh, which I visited recently, they make these beautiful indigenous um, textiles um, from interwoven uh, fabrics and, and patterns, all of the colors, the sim and the shapes having special symbolic value. And then in South Africa, we have the Shreshwe cloth uh, shown on, on the left, uh, which is a totally different design and has become very popular, not only in South Africa, but in other Southern African countries. Here's an innovative way to raise awareness of the uh, coronavirus threat. A, a Sharon Reefer, who's a hairdresser in a poor suburb of Nairobi called Kabira, developed a coronavirus hairstyle because she noticed that the young people were more aware of the threat posed by coronavirus than their parents. So by wearing this hairstyle, they were raising awareness, um, especially among the older generation. Uh, moving to vehicles, this is a remarkable uh, vehicle called the Turtle, made from spare car parts in the Soomi magazine in Accra um, in Ghana. And um, it has an interesting story in that it came about when an artist from Rotterdam, Mael Smets, and a sociologist, Joost van Honor, visited Ghana to learn about the informal econ economy and follow the track of auto part waste in the West African country. They came across this giant Suami magazine auto part scrapyard where old coal car parts are sorted and sold by over 200,000 technicians in 12,000 informal workshops. They realized that not all cars in Ghana end up as third-hand vehicles or waste, as in a dynamic auto part recycling industry that was building so-called new car cars from scrap parts. And with the assistance of the Dutch government, they developed the first turtle car named after the reptile uh, due to its robust construction. And Turtle One became the first Ghanaian car to be seen in the West when it toured motor shows and was gleefully displayed next to the fully electric Tesla S. The Turtle, which has no electronics and is very easy to maintain and repair, is arguably the lowest tech automobile in the world and is somewhat reminiscent of the Psychobilly Cadillac uh, built from different parts and described in Johnny Cash's famous song, One Piece at a Time. The turtle is a cross between steampunk and disinnovation and is a classic product of the post-industrial revolution. As it does not comply with international safety and patent standards, it cannot be sold abroad, but it has potential to be useful in Africa. Here's an, another remarkable uh, innovative project on the sort of medium tech level, the so-called dung beetle project. It's a collaborative project between Alliance Earth, a South African inventor, Pierre Pretorius, and an American artist, Nathan Honey, and has given rise to this educational sculpture that turns single-use plastic bags into usable fuel. 
Um, it's called the dung beetle project because it's inspired by the insect's ability to clean up waste and transform it into something useful. So shredded plastic is gasified in an oxygen-free chamber. The gases are collected and the plastic residue is recycled, uh, circulated and burned again. Now after running through cooling ribs, the gases are condensed into a liquid fuel. The system produces low emission diesel, petrol and thin gas without any harmful emissions. And this is uh, the prototype, which is currently traveling around South Africa. And in addition to uh, recycling plastic, it also has a built-in education program. He has a, a project based in Cape Town uh, called Solar Turtle. And, and Solar Turtle is a project where different size containers and, 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 and other facilities uh, powered by solar are being set up in rural areas so that small gig economies can uh, develop around them. Right, let's move on then to uh, Henry Forietta, Forettia. Um, he is a chicken farmer in Cameroon and he's developed an app that called Save the Chicken that uses artificial intelligence, big data and big data and analyt analytics to produce predictive models that function in real time and facilitate the rapid and accurate detection and diagnosis of poultry diseases. The app is accessed via a, a smartphone and it's possible for farmers to respond quickly when a disease is detected, which decreases the risk of transmission. The app uses data captured from different locations to provide farmers with the means to monitor and control both the birds and the environment. And this is achieved in three simple steps. A farmer takes a photograph or a video of the chicken or its feces and submits it via the app. The app scans, analyzes and evaluates the condition and then provides the results and treatment advice to the farmer. And farmers can also consult a veterinarian using the platform. The Agri-Protein uh, Fly Farm is a remarkable initiative just outside Cape Town. Uh, the founders realized that fish and poultry naturally feed on, on the uh, larvae of, of flies. So they've developed this ultra sophisticated uh, fly farm. Um, and the model has been so successful and it's by far the biggest fly farm in the world that it is now being rolled out in Australia, in uh, the USA, uh, in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. An example, it's probably familiar to you, um, the crossover between high and low tech. Uh, Louis Liebenberg developed this remarkable device called the Cyber Tracker, uh, which is a um, it's basically a GPS device that captures information. And what he's done is he's captured the, the knowledge of sand hunters in the Kalahari, but he uses an icon based uh, interface rather than letters. So they can input data, they can understand the data, and it's mutually beneficial. Another example locally is Percy Moyles, the uh, ophthalmologist from Johannesburg, who famously developed the cryoprobe, on which he, he which he used to operate on Margaret Thatcher and and um, Nelson Mandela. Uh, it uses a frozen tip to remove cataracts uh, from the eye. Um, and one of my favorite examples of the crossover between indigenous knowledge and, and, and Western science, or science is that developed by Mutoni Masindi called the Itiki Drought Predictor. She grew up in a, a farming community in rural Kenya, where she learned that farmers predict the weather and especially the threat of droughts by relying on indigenous knowledge about natural cycles. For instance, when flowers bloom, the behavior of mammals or changes in the numbers of migrating insects and birds. And she realized that while these natural signals are useful, they are not accurate. So she decided to develop a tool that uses modern science and indigenous knowledge to improve the accuracy of weather predictions for farmers who do not have access to modern web-based forecasts. 
Her PhD at, the, at UCT was entitled Itiki, the Bridge Between African Indigenous Knowledge and Modern Science on Drought Prediction, which set the tone for her project. And she's now head of the Department of Information Technology at the Central University of Technology in the Free State, and has developed a smartphone app and website, Itiki, that combines indigenous knowledge and accurate weather prediction data and acts as an early warning system for small scale farmers. Here's another remarkable um, example of African innovation. In the remote high central riff of northern Morocco, a very mountainous area, the local tribes people have been isolated from the rest of the country for several reasons. Firstly, the inaccessibility of where they live. And secondly, the fact that they make most of their money by growing uh, hemp um, for cannabis. Now they face a problem in that there's insufficient wood due to deforestation for them to use um, to build houses. But a novel solution is being developed in consultation with German architect and hemp pioneer, Monica Brummer. She has noticed that one of the byproducts of cannabis cultivation is cannabis straw, which has been used traditionally for making buildings in the Rift. And she plans to move the Rift's cannabis-based economy away from using naturally occurring marijuana strains that are processed into kif, the potent form of cannabis that is made into hashish, towards more positive goals. And while kif production is illegal in Morocco, it does generate income to support over 80,000 uh, people. But they're under constant threat of persecution and receive a pittance from the criminals who market the hashish ashish internationally at a huge profit. She has found that over 8,000 tons of cannabis straw goes to waste in the Rift region every year and is building houses, schools, and other public buildings with this material. And in 2019, together with students um, at the National School of Architecture, she designed and built uh, this unique spherical solar powered house uh, from locally sourced hemp, plant bioresins and other non-synthetic materials. So it's a wonderful example of problem solving using in um, technology. Uh, David Fumi of Johannesburg is another um, great innovator. Uh, he is born with an entrepreneurial spirit and has never been afraid to uh, dream big. Uh, he studied 3D animation before graduating from a San Francisco-based animation school and in 2005 founded the award-winning Penthouse Motion Pictures, a broadcast design and animation studio. But his dreams were even bigger, so he went on to study robotics and AI online. He's determined to become a leader in these fields in Africa and has founded a technology company called Blackchain that identifies problems and finds solutions through technology. And it's founded on four pillars to inspire, identify talent, nurture skills, and innovate. An innovator that many of us are probably familiar with by now is Lucky Nechadzati of Limpopo who grew up not being able to communicate with his parents as both were born deaf. As he is a problem solver, Lucky went out, set out to create a hand glove which translates sign language into voice, text and voice to sign language, animation, so that he could communicate with his parents. When the talking glove sensor is connected to a mobile application on a cell phone, it can also be used to make phone calls. Lucky's um, innovation will not only help his parents, but will empower deaf and hard of hearing people throughout Africa and beyond. Brian Getter is another example of a very determined innovator. Uh, he's a software engineer who was misdiagnosed with malaria three times, and he decided to do something about it. He was aware that malaria is one of the leading causes of death in Ghana and that the best way to combat it, it is through rapid and accurate diagnosis, treatment and containment. His experience was that malaria blood tests were time consuming, required trained lab technicians and were sometimes inaccurate as he had experienced. And for the past seven years, a 27 year old um, from Uganda's Makerere University has worked with scientists, doctors and software engineers 
to develop a simple method to test for malaria without a blood sample, a microscope, or tra trained technicians. And after much frustrating toil, he developed the matiscope from the Swahili word for treatment, a portable shoebox sized device that works with a smartphone. Patients with malaria like symptoms, including high fever, chills, or headaches, place a finger in the device's cradle, which uses magnets and a beam of red light to detect changes in blood cells caused by malaria. The readings are analyzed by smartphone, diagnosed, and if positive, can be uploaded onto a nationwide grid. The device is furthermore reusable and provides results within two minutes. Quite remarkable. And locally at UCT, Professor Kelly, Kelly Shibali and his team have developed the very first one-pill uh, malaria treatment. Uh, Kelly had a difficult start to his um, career. He first wanted to study accounting, but was um, unsuccessful in his application uh, to university. He then remembered his fascination with chemistry at school and decided to study the subject instead. And his passion eventually enabled him to complete a PhD in organic chemistry at the University of Cambridge in England. And after doing research in England and in the USA, he moved to UCT, where he has led a team that developed this malaria drug candidate. Um, after screening over 40,000 different um, uh, drugs. And this is the first time that an African-led drug discovery project has taken a compound from screening to human trials. Right, moving back to pro uh, vehicles. This is the very first production car developed anywhere in South Africa or in Africa um, back in October, 1956. It was designed and made by an immigrant cab uh, mechanic um, and racing driver from Coventry called John Myers and his friends in Johannesburg. And their aim was to produce a car that was modern enough to be competitive, have good road holding capability for daily use and yet be affordable and easy to maintain. And I had the good fortune to meet uh, John Myers while he was in his nineties, uh, enjoyed a few cups of coffee with him. And he told me about those extraordinary early days when they were pioneering the use of fiberglass and, and other techniques. Uh, sadly, he died recently. In my book, I talk about 18 different African countries that have different, uh, developed vehicles. Uh, yes, a re rather remarkable one, um, which is the legendary Libyan rocket or African rocket car, Saruk al-Jamadira, developed specifically for the late Muhammad Gaddafi in Libya in 1999. Um, it was fast and luxurious and was pitted against the German luxury car market, but unfortunately it never went into full production. But its designers uh, claimed that it was one of the safest and most efficient cars ever invented and had many innovative safety features, including the ability to drive for long distances on flat tires and a fully electronic safety system with airbags on all four seats. A much more successful commercial venture um, was the small but powerful Wally's car, which is made in Tunisia, and they've developed a whole range uh, for the lucrative off-road uh, market. And they've built up a strong reputation for affordable, reliable, and, and powerful uh, four, uh, four by fours. And despite the relatively small size of their vehicles, which are similar to Suzuki's and Skoda off-roaders in South Africa, they're selling very well in North Africa, the Middle East, and also in Europe. Now, digitization, of course, has been uh, um, one of the hallmarks of South African, of, of African innovation. And in some respects, Africa is ahead of the rest of the world. And this, just for interest, is a, a piece of street art done by Stephen Smith, in the Salt River uh, suburb in Cape Town, uh, one of many world-class artworks done outdoors um, in that suburb. Now, Mpeza, in my opinion, whoever invented Mpeza should have got the, the Nobel Prize. It has totally revolutionized uh, the way in which money is transferred, and it originated in Kenya. 
we don't know exactly who the inventor was, but the a former Safaricom CEO, Michael Joseph, should probably receive the credit for sparking the thought process that led to its invention, as the company at the time was focusing on building innovative new products. Um, he asked his creative team to come up with some ideas. And although the first Impreza uh, developed in a different way, it has subsequently become extremely successful and has completely revolutionized uh, the way in which people who don't have a bank account or collateral to open one uh, can send money home or, or buy products. Here's another remarkable recent invention. Sandili and Gopo from the uh, University of KwaZulu-Natal was doing his PhD at the CSR in Pretoria, uh, developing something that sophisticated laboratories around the world had tried but failed to develop, and that is a digital laser. And uh, the way in uh, which uh, traditional lasers worked, if you wanted to refocus the, the beam or create a pattern in the beam, you had to attach complicated devices to the front of the laser gun. Um, but Sandili came up with the idea of using holograms to create patterns uh, within the laser, uh, and that resulted in a complete revolution in how uh, lasers can be used locally and internationally. Moving on to robotics, uh, in Tunisia, uh, throughout the uh, COVID-19 lockdown, They've been using these P guard robotic policemen with a controller uh, made by Nova Products in, in Tunis City in, in Tunisia. And um, they've been used to ensure that people were observing the coronavirus lockdown. And if the robot spied anyone work, walking in the deserted streets, it approached them and asked them why they were out. They then had to show their IDs to the robot's camera. Um, and the, the robot have thermal imaging cameras and LIDAR, light detection and ranging technology. So they were able to photograph the documents and send them back to the control uh, who could either authorize or not the, uh, the pedestrian. Our drones have become very, very important in Africa and there are many initiatives that I could mention. Um, this is one of them. Um, uh, where Daniel Morfo of Zipline Ghana, working with the US Kana, uh, company Zipline, has developed a range of uh, delivery um, drones, delivering medical products and also uh, post uh, into remote areas uh, in Ghana. Um, there are other initiatives I can mention. Uh, Kelly Ronaldo has been uh, using battery powered fixed wing zips uh, to deliver uh, emergency medical supplies. And in Malawi, uh, the African Drone and Data Academy, a UNICEF sponsored partnership, um, has pioneered the field of drone tech training. And they are now offering master's degrees in, in drone technology. And a similar thing is happening in Accra, in Ghana, where the Ghana Robotics Academy was founded uh, to develop the new, next generation of Ghanaians. Uh, to design drones and other robots. Of course, we are all aware of the giant uh, Sareo or SKA project, which started uh, as a Meerkat um, and then move, uh, it's moving on into the main uh, SKA project. And this is the biggest uh, scientific and technological project in the Southern Hemisphere. It will be headquartered in South Africa and involved many other African countries, uh, including some in the Western Indian Ocean Islands and uh, with a collaborative venture um, in Australia. And there are many, uh, many innovations coming out of SKA already. This is just one of them, SCARAB, which is a scalable energy efficient field programmable gate array as part of the uh, SKA project. And here is an Earth satellite dish, uh, previously belonged to Vodafone which has now been refurbished um, and will be part of the um, SKA array in Africa. Then a quite remarkable project uh, is the Internet in the Sky uh, project um, in Kenya. And this is a balloon suspended internet tower with solar panels and, and batteries, uh, first introduced in July 2020. They are placed in a geostationary orbit 
at about 20 kilometers altitude, so well above the weather and well above um, airplane routes. And Kenya is uh, the first country in the world to have commercial high-speed internet using balloons in the sky. And uh, the project aims to uh, provide affordable 4G internet to undercovered or uncovered rural communities in the very mountainous Rift Valley region. A fleet of 35 internet balloons fitted with solar panels and batteries is already floating um, in the stratosphere and um, providing the service that uh, they designed to. And according to Alistair Westgraff, the chief executive of the company Loon, that is uh, running this project, we are effectively creating the next layer of mobile network around the world. We look like a cell tower 20 kilometers in the sky. The floating base stations have a wider coverage, about 100 times the area of a traditional uh, cell tower. So there's another uh, image of the internet in the sky. Um, the way they work is that they beam internet signals to earth-based stations, which then transmit them to users through service providers. And a single a balloon will provide internet connectivity to an area of about 80 kilometers in diameter and serve about a thousand users on the ground at a signal strength similar to 4G browsing speeds. And the, the Google internet balloons are expected to have a very positive effect, not only on e-commerce, e-learning and e-health, but also e-agriculture and e-government in remote parts of Kenya and could also reduce data rates. Now I'd like to go through um, some of the real characters that have come out in my study of innovation in Africa and uh, mention some of their achievements. Nawal al-Sadawi is a legendary Egyptian uh, physician and, and feminist uh, who is focused among many other things on the issue of female genital mutilation, which is a ritual cutting of some or all of the external female genitalia. The UNICEF estimated in 2016 that 200 million women living in 30 countries, including 27 African states, have undergone the procedure. And it's a practice rooted in gender inequality, attempts to control women's sexuality and ideas about purity, modesty and beauty. Many women have called for the banning of FGM. And uh, Nawal al Sadawi has criticized the practice uh, in the several of her books, which caused her to be um, banned. And she even lost her job as a director general of public health, but continued to uh, pursue the issue. As another hero of African innovation, <clears throat> Dr. Wangari Matai appearing on the Time magazine cover in 2001. Uh, she's a Kenyan and was the first woman in Central and East Africa to earn a PhD in 1971. But it was her work among rural people that had earned her international accolades, including the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004. In 1977, she founded the Green Belt Movement to teach women how to earn a living by planting trees. And this project, which she initiated in response uh, to the wholesale deforestation of Kenya, was seen as a threat by land grabbing politicians. And she spent International Women's Day in 2001 um, in prison. Undeterred, she actively pursued the links between environmentalism, poverty reduction, and democratic rights. And in recognition of her deep commitment to the environment, she received many international accolades and was an ambassador uh, for peace and a messenger for peace uh, of the United Nations. And by the time of her death in 2011, her Green Belt Movement had launched branches in 30 countries, planted over 50 million trees and changed the course of forest conservation in Africa. Well, our own Mark Shuttleworth, uh, a supreme IT innovator, uh, he used his riches wise wisely to promote science communication and also the development of open source software and he remains a very active uh, participant behind the scenes in making um, uh, computers and computer programs accessible to a broad public. Michel Elegby, who's the originator of InterSwitch, uh, he's an optimist who thinks big. 
um, and he took on the formidable challenge of weaning Nigerians off cash when he established InterSwitch in Lagos in 2002. His company pioneered the development of infrastructure to digitize the mainly paper ledger and cash-based economy in Nigeria. And today its technology processes over 500 million transactions a month. And InterSwitch's Verve payment card is the largest domestic debit card system in Africa. Allegbi always envisaged that his technology would eventually facilitate the electronic circulation of money throughout Africa. Here's a, another major achiever, also from Nigeria, Alekon Dangoti. And the mindset of uh, Dangoti, who is Africa's richest businessman, is epitomized by the spirit of Harambi. He has no plans to rest on his laurels and has set his sights on domination in several market sectors. In the cement market, where he first made his fortune, he plans to expand the capacity on the continent by 30%. In November 2019, he announced plans to build a $2 billion fertilizer factory in Togo. And later this year, he will see uh, the completion of Africa's largest oil refinery, the Dangote Refinery which will process about 650,000 barrels of crude oil a day and will also start producing refined petroleum products within months of its completion. And this will reverse the decades old system in Nigeria of exporting crude oil and having to import refined oil-based products and will free up billions of dollars of Nigerian currency. Mustafa Sisi is um, the head of Google's Artificial Intelligence Center in Accra in Ghana, where his research focuses on the essential requisites of artificial intelligence, that is fairness, transparency, and reliability. Now, he believes that Africa's technology solutions should be developed within the continent, and is developing AI programs that will help farmers to diagnose blights that might affect their harvests. He also plans to translate useful computer software into African languages. Locally, Kerry Sink is a, a remarkable innovator, not widely acknowledged in my opinion. As a 14 year old, Kerry kickstarted her glittering career at the Oceanographic Research Institute in Durban during the school holidays. She late, later worked at the Monterey Bay Aquarium in California and then returned to South Africa in 2000. Here, she was shocked to find that local shopkeepers and restaurants openly sold protected and endangered fish to their customers. In 2002, her research revealed that 92% of the retailers were contravening the Marine Living Resources Act in some way, mostly out of ignorance. So she launched a campaign to raise awareness among suppliers, retailers, shoppers, and restaurant goers on which should fish should and should not be caught, distributed, sold, and eaten. And in 2004, at Kerry's initiative, WWSA established the South African Sustainable Seafood Initiative, SASI, to inform and educate our hoteliers, our restauranteurs, seafood lovers about sustainable seafood. And I'm sure you all know how SASI works, and I hope that you're implementing it. Another example from the environmental field is Agnes uh, Calibata, whose um, ambitions have known no bounds. As president of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA, <clears throat> this Rwandan is working to increase the incomes and improve the food security of over 40 million farming households in 18 African countries. AGRA, which is a partnership driven institution that is Africa-led and farmer-centered, was formed in 2006 in response to a call from the former UN Secretary General, the late Kofi Annan, who stated the time had come for Africa to wage a uniquely African green revolution. And Kalibati's immense contribution is reflected in the many international honors she has received, including an honorary doctorate from McGill University and um, winning the US National Academy of Sciences Public Welfare Award. She was also appointed by the UN Secretary General as his special envoy for the 2021 UN Food Systems Summit. 
Machadisa Muti is Africa's medical superstar. Uh, her parents were both medical doctors and she swore that she would not become one, but did. She also vowed not to marry a medical doctor, but did. She spent her whole career in the public healthcare sector and is now as the WHO's regional director for Africa, the spokesperson for the global organization on the COVID-19 crisis. She was born in Kwatema in Gauteng, South Africa, and was a precociously intelligent child who at the age of 10 began high school at a boarding school in Swaziland and then moved with her family to Botswana where her mother developed planning, planning, so family planning services and her father became the smallpox commissioner for South Africa. Throughout the COVID-19 outbreak, Muti has been the voice of Africa to the world in her weekly briefings from Brazzaville, in Republic of Congo, where the WHO is located. And switching effortlessly from English and French, she has calmly detailed Africa's efforts uh, to combat the crisis, a reassuring voice in a collective storm. But her main role has been to coordinate public health responses in collaboration with leaders and ministries throughout the continent and to persuade them to make difficult decisions. Another local hero is uh, Professor Tabella Niokong, um, now at Rhodes University. She was poor, born into a poor family in Lesotho in 1951, and as a young girl was sent to live with her grandparents in the mountains of Lesotho and learnt about science by observing wildlife while she looked after the sheep. She would spend one day at school and the next day as a shepherd, and her main ambition at the time was to own a pair of shoes. When she started school, she was steered away from science, but with two years to go, she changed direction and showing remarkable perseverance, completed the three-year course in two years. After completing her university studies in Lesotho in Canada, she received a Fulbright scholarship uh, to carry out postdoctoral research in the USA. She then returned to Southern Africa and joined the staff of Rhodes University, where she is now a distinguished professor. Her fields and research include nanotechnology and phytodynamic um, therapy, with the latter paving the way for safer cancer detection and treatment without the debilitating side effects of chemotherapy. Uh, she's received many accolades and award, been rated as one of the top scientists in Africa, uh, received the order for Mapungupwe bronze and is regarded as one of the most influential women in science in Africa. Another local hero is Malala de Yoyo. He was born in Napopo in 1970 and also knew poverty and hardship as a youth. He's now a respected uh, researcher in applied mechanics, ultralight materials, green building and renewable energy who has worked at the interface between academia and industry in the USA and in South Africa. He's passionate about using modern technology to fight poverty and to develop the underdeveloped youth, underprivileged youth. And in 2008, established RETETSA, a renewable resource-driven technology concept center that promotes cross-disciplinary industrial research. And he already has a number of very significant um, inventions to his name. Rachel Sabandi uh, of Malawi founded the first innovation hub, uh, M Hub, um, in Malawi. She is a computer scientist, a STEM educator, social entrepreneur, um, and she's also the chair of Girl Effect Malawi and a board member of Give Directly Malawi. And since the establishment of MWeb in 2013, she's championed the development and deployment of innovative technology uh, solutions in elections monitoring, citizen engagement, and agriculture in Malawi. Uh, and this is now extended to several other African countries. She has also impacted on the lives of over 40,000 young innovators by creating an entrepreneurship curriculum and pioneering initiatives to teach software coding uh, to develop the next generation of technology creators. In 2012, she became an alumna of President Obama's Young African Leaders Initiative. Tony Elmolo uh, is a leading um, 
Nigerian industrialist and philanthropist who is the founder um, of the organization uh, called Africa Capitalism. Um, his uh, company is head for his foundation is headquartered in Lagos and he, the Tony Milu Foundation uh, that he established is committed to the economic transformation of Africa by enhancing the competitiveness and growth of the private sector through strong support of entrepreneurship. And he has established a brilliant track record in this regard. And the guiding principles of his foundation um, are derived from his inclusive economic philosophy of Africa capitalism, which promotes long-term sustained and vibrant African-led private sector investment in key sectors of the continent's economy. And through its programs, uh, a lawyer, uh, he seeks to institutionalize luck, which is a, a very interesting phrase, and create an environment in which entrepreneurship can flourish. As another example of an African innovator, um, a 28 year old Nigerian, uh, Abu Yeju, is already an established innovator. His first is a successful startup, Andila, which he co founded in 2014 identifies and develops smart software engineers to help global companies overcome the severe shortage of skilled software developers. And he gained in a global recognition in 2016 when his company received a $24 million grant from Mark Zuckerberg and now has offices in Nigeria, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, and the USA. In 2017, he co-founded Flutterwave which is a platform that makes it easier for banks and businesses to process payments across the continent. And in 2019, he launched the Future Africa Initiative, which pro provides capital coaching and collaborative community for startup founders who are investing in rebuilding Africa. And through this initiative, he plans to make $50,000 capital available to at least 20 startup founders every year. And then one of my favorite and unlikely innovator, Bobby Wine, the Ugandan pop star, who spent his career singing about social injustice and in 2017 decided to take things further by running for and winning a seat in the Ugandan pro, uh, parliament. Then the 37 year old singer announced plans to run for the presidency, which he did this year. Uh, he didn't win, but he attracted a great deal of attention to the causes that he supports. In 2020, Bobby Wine led a star-studded galaxy of African musicians and politicians who composed and performed songs about COVID-19, including George Weah, the president of Liberia, and singers and songwriters from Senegal, Gabon, Nigeria, the DRC, South Africa, and Ghana. Bobby Wine has also launched a collective call to action, hashtag don't go viral, and has invited creators from all over the world to share their work on share information. He argues that in this time of crisis, humanity needs artists and cultural entrepreneurs to bring people together, to activate their collective intelligence and shared humanity, and to translate public health information into everyday language that everyone can understand. He also emphasizes that while it's important to prevent COVID-19 from spreading, it is equally important to prevent misinformation and discrimination from going viral. And recently, Bobby Wine, together with some of his musical collaborators, Nubian Lee and Bebby Cool, have been involved by the Ugandan government um, in the um, COVID-19 awareness program. Right, well, that concludes my very quick overview of just some of the innovators and innovations that are mentioned in my recent book. And I'd like to end with a few slides on what I've identified as the key qualities of African innovation. Firstly, as Stephen said in his introduction, it's expressed simultaneously at all three levels, from high to middle to low tech, um, as the needs and the wants of the people in a particular community dictate. The high-tech innovations tend to blend seamlessly into mid-tech innovations, while the underbelly of low-tech innovations continues to proliferate. The different levels feed into one another to create a unique mix that generates solutions that solve or strive to solve the problems on the continent. 
And this, what I call the stepladder of innovations from low to medium to high, promotes the upskilling of African innovators so that they can eventually become global players, even if they've had very humble beginnings at the outset. African innovation is also characterized by its exuberance and spontaneity, its flouting of the rules and its homegrown agenda. The creativity in Africa is often sparked in the resource strapped environments in which many African innovators are forced to work. And most young people in Africa, especially girls, have experienced failure as well as discrimination and inequality during their short lives and learned to cope with it. And this has been a variable quality. They've learned that failing often and quickly and getting up and starting again is a far more beneficial lesson in life than nearly always succeeding. So I'd like to end with a few quotes um, from my book on um, the nature of African innovation. So what is the nature of the African innovation? The continent has a personality like Ubuntu that is difficult to define in English. That definition probably also applies to the nature of its innovations. The spirit of Africa is unlike that of any other continent. Raw, untamed, impish, dynamic, always on edge. It is also frustratingly unpredictable, but at the same time, bold and fearless. And its lingering inferiority complex, stoked by colonialism, is rapidly evaporating. The continent has endured physical and socioeconomic calamities, yet it continues to survive and thrive. These events have shaped a resilient and highly determined class of entrepreneurial people who are motivated rather than discouraged by the adversity and who thrive on challenges. They also share a unique bond of togetherness, a shared soul and connectedness with one another that is epitomized by Ubuntu. And I'd like to quote uh, Credo Mutwa, the South African philosopher on Ubuntu. That is Ubuntu, the feeling with each other, the feeling for each other. It is not a mystery, it is something plain and simple that I must do to other people what I want other people to do to me. That I am a Muntu, a human being, because of other human beings around me. If there were no other human beings on this planet, I would no longer be a Muntu, no longer be a child of Ubuntu. I believe that Africa has the prospect of becoming the brightest continent in the 21st century if it develops its natural and human resources to their full potential. But we need to recognize that African innovation expresses itself in a different way. It is more akin to the role swapping improvisational jazz band that has a high level of alertness to new opportunities or riffs and co-create something new rather than a formal Western symphony orchestra that is conducted according to a strict formula. The improvisational style of African innovation is epitomized by the hybrid, culturally mobile Ethiopia uh, jazz of legendary Ethiopian musician Mulato Estato. I'd also like to mention the uh, concept put together by Waweri Liking, the African philosopher, the concept of practical creativity that is often sparked in highly constrained restored resource strapped environments. Liking supports Plato's age old maxim that necessity is a mother of invention and argues that need is what spurs people, especially women into creative action. The tension between African poor yet hopeful and Western wealthy yet depressed may be explained by the extent to which deprivation promotes innovation. In the West, the more wealth and technology people have, the more they log into the internet, but the less happy they seem to be. In developed countries, there's also a problem with young people who believe that if they work or practice hard enough, they will succeed as they feel entitled to be in control of the outcomes of their lives by virtue of their sweat equity. When they lose or fail, they are racked with self-doubt and self-blame 
as their parents have protected themselves, uh, them from discomfort and disorder. This is not a problem in Africa, where many, if not most young people, especially girls, have experienced failure, as well as discrimination and inequality during their short lives and learn to cope with it. In fact, failing, as I've said before, failing often and quickly and getting up and starting again is a far more beneficial lesson in life than nearly always succeeding. Triumph over adversity by resilient, resourceful people at all levels of society. That I believe is the nature of African innovation and it is something worth celebrating. Thank you. <clears throat> I just end with a few pictures of some of the books from which my ideas are, are derived. Um, what a great idea and South African inventions, curious notions, and then the Rumbi book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bruton for that very enlightening presentation. I also found that um, after each new uh, invention that you presented to us, there were a whole lot of questions that I wanted to ask about that specific uh, invention. And then by the time you got onto the next invention or innovation, I'd forgotten that one and I was coming up with a whole lot of other new questions and, and comments that I would like to make. But if anyone would like to ask questions, uh, please write them down in the Q&A section on, at the bottom of your screen, and we'll see how we have time. Uh, I'm not quite sure how much time you have for Professor Bruton, but we'll see what we can do. Uh, I think one of the, the I, scariest- I have as much time as necessary, thank you. Thank you very much. I think one of the most, the scariest inventions that I've found was the, the one in Kenya where the robot would ask you for your documents and see if you are entitled to be out or whether you are violating one of the COVID-19 protocols. My, my next vision was, are you going to be arrested by a robot? Is that, your, is that the next step in the whole line here? Um, or, or what happens if you don't have the right documents? Well, the, the robots certainly are uh, able to give you a warning and, uh, and that warning is then recorded uh, on the, the police database. And apparently if you get uh, more than a few warnings then you can be arrested. Um, but I'm not sure whether the robot actually does the arresting. Maybe that will come. <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that, would, that would be quite, that's a little bit scary. A lot of the yeah. other inventions are, are, are very encouraging and so much that you presented here, it's very difficult to absorb all of that. I've also got a, a question here from one of the viewers, from Monica Newton, who said, thank you so much for your presentation, inspiring examples of innovation about. Looking across all of the inventions that you have profiled in your book, have you been able to identify any common traits or experiences across the inventions or inventors? In other words, is there a common thread between all of them? I think the common thread is many of them came from very humble environments. They had to overcome enormous odds. They were not necessarily working in well-equipped laboratories. They had little financial support, but they persevered and they produced stuff that major laboratories around the world had been unable to do. So I would say that that is the one common thread I've found, that it is a characteristic of um, African innovation and one that we can be very proud of. But it does point to the fact that we need to make life easier for our innovators uh, by supporting them, by providing them with the infrastructure and also um, you know, emotional support for the hardships that they're enduring. And, and do you think that perhaps because of the lack of resources and falling back to the, the old cliche that you mentioned earlier, um, invention, uh, necessity is the mother of invention, maybe it's because there's so much necessity that Africans can be so much, so creative, so inventive. Yes, I do believe that's true, uh, that, you know, we disproportionately um, 
innovative if one takes into account the facilities that are available and mm -hmm. uh, the educational opportunities that, that young African people have had. So uh, definitely, but that doesn't mean we need to uh, perpetuate the, uh, the difficult conditions sure. under which they work. Um, but it certainly has framed their characters. Okay, uh, let me remind viewers that we are taking questions. If you have any questions that you'd like to put to Professor Bruton, please write them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen and we'll put them to uh, Professor Bruton. Let me just put a, another question to you that's something that's been a bit confusing for me. Sometimes we tend to use invention and innovation interchangeably. Are they the same thing or, or what's the difference? Yeah, they are difficult to define, but to me, an invention is a new product or service that hasn't been provided before. And it's gone beyond the in concept stage. It's actually entered the market and been commercially successful. Whereas an innovation is an improvement on a past invention. Um, most so-called inventions are in fact innovations, but there are some which were brand new. And of course, one needs to separate an invention from a, a, a concept or an idea which never reached fruition and never went to the market. Mm -hmm. And I noticed in your presentation, you placed specific emphasis on the innovation of women and how women have been poorly treated uh, basically in, in African society and by the science fraternity. Um, do you have a, a famous woman that you can highlight or you think is the most exceptional? Well, that's a difficult one. And in fact, um, you know, of the 700 odd inventors in, in, that I cover in my book, more than half of them are women. And it's quite extraordinary um, the, you know, the extent to which they have not only developed innovations, but led science policy and become spokespeople for science and ambassadors for science. But I, I would say uh, Dr. Wangari Matai uh, was a, an absolute exception decades ahead of her time and did a terrific job during her lifetime. And, and how do you think we can stimulate further innovation in Africa? Well, you know, I think a lot of people listening to this talk will not have heard of many of these inventions made elsewhere in Africa before. And that, that is the reason I wrote this book, because uh, after I'd completed my book on South African inventions, um, you know, I had gathered so much information on inventions from other countries, which, and when I talked to people, they were completely unaware of them. Uh, I remember talk uh, at a, a motor car festival talking to some historians on the motor car and just you know posing the question how many commercially viable motor vehicles have been developed elsewhere in Africa and the answer I got was none and that's completely untrue uh, in fact if anything South Africa needs to be ashamed of its poor record of producing virtually no uh, homegrown motor vehicles and we nearly produced the dual electric car but unfortunately it never went into production. Uh, we produced the Protea and, and the uh, Flamingo and the Dart early on, and there have been various um, improvisations around four-wheel drive vehicles. But compared with other African countries who have developed whole fleets of, of, of vehicles, uh, you know, we haven't got a great record. Although I must say that HISA, Hydrogen South Africa, are developing some very innovative hydrogen-powered vehicles. And of course, the Bell Company, based in Richards Bay, is a world-class company in terms of off-road off hauling and forestry and road building vehicles. Do you think that there's a, a, perhaps a problem in that South African inventors, innovators, are able to come up with new products, new inventions, but there seems to be a bit of a block in getting it to market, in getting it into full production, to take it past the first prototype? Yeah, the, I mean, we, we have great thinkers, we have great innovators, and, you know, Elon Musk is one of them. But there, there are a number of reasons why our inventions haven't gone to um, the market internationally. 
Um, and, and part of it, I suppose, is just sort of a risk averse environment in where which people feel you cannot compare, compete against the big companies and the companies that are able to manufacture their vehicles using relatively cheap labor um, in Asia. So, um, you know, they've, they've never had the capital to develop the quantities that are necessary to make a, a, a vision commercially viable. And, and I have a question here now from one of the viewers. Where do you think Africa is on the, spe on the world spectrum of invention and innovation? How do you think this, how do you think access to capital has affected this? Yeah, well, I, I definitely think we're moving from being the dark continent to the bright continent, that our potential is as great as that of any other continent. But when one looks at the amount of investment being made in places like China, South Korea, Taiwan, USA, and, and, and parts of Europe, you know, we're just nowhere near that level of investment, and that must impact our ability to compete internationally. But uh, uh, one business. thing I know is that South African thinkers and doers are, are well sought after worldwide and highly regarded. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's uh, time that we close this presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Bruton, for that wonderful presentation. We all enjoyed it. Thank you also to Freddy Mashati of SciFace Africa and his whole staff for putting it together. And from me, Stephen Lang, thank you for joining us and look out for more exciting SciFest Africa webinars on the way.